Started off on the on the right foot. I would ask our state uh, with a plate. I'm going to have Frank Pounders give us the invocation, if you will. And uh, the sick call. I'm sure that most of you will be interested in the fact that Ralph McDowell is on. Hello, Ralph. How many times he get here without missing a meeting? Twenty-six. Twenty-six. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven years. And uh, his sticker is messing around with him a little bit, so he's home this morning. He's okay. He's taking medication and couldn't be here, so he sends his greetings and his love uh, in, in that process also. Also, uh, I think you might want to remember uh, Charles Baker, who is here in this facility and unable to be here with us this morning. Uh, Laurie Crapo is in uh, a, a, a facility and couldn't be here, but he sends his love also. So, did you know that this place was 90 years old? Mm -hmm. This organization is 90 years old. Yep. Good. Celebrate it. Enjoy with me as we witness the presence of God right here. Helping us celebrate 90 years of patriotic service to this country. Doing those things which in our hearts makes us good citizens of this Democratic Republic. And knowing that as we do that, we provide for the future of this nation so it can continue in liberty, justice, and freedom for everyone. Know that God is here blessing each and every one of us as we participate in this great work. In the name of the Christ we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Frank. This morning we're going to have a speaker that you'll hear very shortly, but I've asked him because of his veteran status if Don Graves would lead us in the Pledge to Lead. This is the greatest flag in the world with the greatest history. Let's acknowledge it. Let's respect it. Let's pledge our allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Dr. Gary Sisson. Good to see you again. Would you please lead us in the pledge to the Texas yes. flag? Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. <coughs> Brother Jim Battles, would you please lead us in the SAR affirmation? We, the descendants of the Republic and solemnly pledge ourselves to 
to defend them against every law. Thank you. And now, where is Tracy Pounders? Tracy, how's your voice? Pretty good. Please leave us. Okay. My country is a deep, sweet land of liberty, of the everybody here and thank you for the, the fine attendance. We'd like to get this to grow even more every meeting going forward, but I appreciate the time and the hot weather coming out. <clears throat> 243 years and nine days ago, the Declaration of Independence was ratified. It was a Thursday. 90 years and nine days ago, this chapter was, was chartered by the State Society. It was a Thursday. And nine days ago, we officially celebrated our 90th anniversary as a chapter. And it was a Thursday. I don't know what significance that has, but Thursdays have been deep in our history. And as we go forward, I don't know what other Thursdays will have, but I know what Saturday mornings have. So I want to get this Saturday morning started. We are fortunate this morning that uh, a friend of the firm has decided to join us. And uh, I have known Mike Conley for a number of years now. He comes from the Van Zandt uh, chapter over in Fort Worth. Uh, a little bit about him for those of you who haven't met Mike. He's born and raised in Fort Worth, went to Carter High School, UTA graduate. He was an accountant, no booze. By the way, Mike, where are you? I did find out something at the National Congress. I found out what accountants really are. Accountants are to our world what happened back in the revolution. They were the people that followed the battle and came roaring in and shot the wounded. <laughs> and, and counted the bullets as they did it, absolutely. And I know you and Pinkerton will have a lot to talk about. Okay. Um, he was in the U.S. Army, 62 to 64, lieutenant of the field artillery. He counted the bullets. There you go. All right. Worked short time in the public accounting, and then became an FBI special agent. Uh, the career took him around the country to Minnesota, South Dakota, Illinois, and he worked in general criminal matters, fraud investigations, etc. He was also a firearms instructor, a SWAT team member, and commander for many years. He returned to Fort Worth. FBI office where he was assistant agent in charge until retirement. Longtime member of the Van Zandt chapter, SAR Fort Worth. He's been secretary, vice president, and now immediate past president. After retirement, he ran a consulting and private investigation firm for approximately 20 years, and in addition to conducting background in investigations on a contract basis for the Bureau. He's married, two children, four grandchildren, and he's now a resident, and actually my neighbor, in Robeson Ranch, because we're the two guys from Denton County that drove here this morning through the traffic. So would you please give rapt attention to my friend Mike Conley. Well, Con gave me about uh, five, uh, five to six minutes to, to visit with you. A couple of things uh, I, bring, uh, I bring welcome from the western side of the, of the Metroplex. Uh, the other thing is the the Board of Managers meeting uh, for the Texas SAR will be this October, and it's going to be in the... Uh, just better to be here. Okay. It's going to be in, uh, in uh, Arlington, and the Arlington chapter and the Fort Worth chapter are, are uh, 
co-sponsor in this particular event. So the VON does several things. Number one is the business meeting of the organization, but it's also the time of when the, the organization is raising funds for the various youth programs that, uh, that we have going. So that's one of the reasons I'm here. Number one, uh, try to get you to sign up for the VON uh, this coming October. Your old member, David, David Temple, back there is the president of the organization, and he will be um, overseeing that, that particular thing. The second thing is, um, in the fundraising, we always have a raffle. I just happen to have some raffle tickets. Um, there are five, uh, five tickets for $20. So I'm hoping, and I'll, I'll hang around at the end of the day, that uh, somebody can come up here, uh, fill it out, uh, five tickets, give me a $20 bill, and uh, hopefully you win. And somebody was uh, oh, wondering on the way. Well, we've got three items that we're going to be raffling. Number one is two tickets to the Cowboy game. I think it is the Redskin game. I may not know which one it is. But I think it's the Redskin game. And I'm going to be sitting with the masses in the stadium. Uh, these these the Cowboy tickets are in the uh, city of Arlington's suite. So uh, it's pretty, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is we've got a, a uh, live screen, flat screen uh, uh, television uh, that we're is in the red. Let me get down the size. The size of this pretty good. Pretty good size. <clears throat> the third item is what I call a Yeti, if I know what a Yeti cooler is, a Yeti style cooler. Uh, it's not the Yeti brand. <clears throat> it is the Cabela's brand, but it functions the same way as the Yeti cooler. So that, that will be uh, the item that's uh, that in the red. So don't get out of here without handing me 20 bucks on you for five days. And the second, second thing we're looking for are donations to the silent auction. That's, uh, the silent auction is what funds a lot of the state's uh, youth programs. Uh, many of the chapters of, of, around the, the state donate items to go into the silent auction. And, it, and also that's another thing I'm, I'm kind of making a, uh, a plea for is to, is to, to stop the auction. What can go in the auction? It can be a collectible item, you know, some of the things you have around here, uh, you know, somebody who would be willing to pay 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 80, 100 dollars for it. Uh, debit cards, Starbucks debit card, Walmart debit card, uh, 50 dollars, 40 dollars, those things can go in there. Any, anything that you think would be a collectible item. Now, Tom, yeah, Tom Whitlock, I think, is already kind of volunteer to whatever it is Dallas Chapter wants to donate to the silent auction. You can get with Tom. Tom will get with, with me and we'll put it into the, uh, the auction. And all the proceeds of that silent auction go to the fix of the field. Yeah, Mike. Mike, just to clarify, if outside agencies donate to the silent auction, it would be classified as a 501c3 donation? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we're, we're giving a letter. If somebody has an item that they're donating that is a some significant value. We've got a little kind of form letter that says you're donating it to the final, it's going to the Van Sant chapter and, and or the Arlington chapter in the both final ones. And we give you a letter if it's a, uh, of it to, to the individual. Any other questions? Thanks. Mike, thank you. Appreciate your attendance. In, in concert with his visit here, Mike is the uh, chairman of the uh, chapter president's council at the state level. And he's involved with a lot of activities and he chairs a meeting that I, that I get a chance to go to and I appreciate you taking the time to be here. In concert with that, I also want to recognize some of our other state level officers that are here. In the back, we have our president and chapter member, David Temple. We have our District 6 Vice President, Gary Lovell. Good to see you, Gary. Appreciate that. We have both, we have the Pounders family here, Tracy, who is the Chancellor, and Frank, who is our spiritual guidance. And thank you all for being here. This morning, and before I introduce uh, Mark to talk about our speaker, a uh, couple things that I want to say, and I, and I hate to make this a commercial from the podium, but don't forget your anniversary cup at the back. Half of the money that you pay for the cup goes to the chapter. So we found a way to make some revenue. And by the way, not a bad cup. 
I kind of like it. So please don't hesitate to do that, and you'll hear some more about some of the other things that you'll be able to participate in this morning. A number of months ago, um, I was invited by one of the DAR chapters to come to Plano to hear our, our, our this, this morning's speaker. And I got in touch with Mark, who's been doing, by the way, Mark Harrison's been doing a fantastic job this year of lining up our speakers, and I'd like to give you some recognition right now, my friend. And it comes with a little bit of knowledge because I wore the dress. I knew. Yeah. Anyhow, this morning I'm going to have Mark introduce our speaker and get prepared because this guy will take you out of your seat. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate that. Uh, we're, actually, we've got a really great treat for today. Uh, Don Graves is here. And I've asked uh, Paul Schwartz, his friend, his, his your driver, keeper, scheduler, yes, all the way. Yeah, I've asked him to come up and uh, tell us a little bit about Don and, and go ahead and introduce him. We might have to adjust the sound a little bit on this. So. Stay behind this magic line. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What an honor to be with an organization like yours. We are thrilled. In fact, I think I, I would. I brought Don up to Robeson Ranch. Yeah, not long ago. Okay. And we're really proud to see that this, the word is spreading about Don because he's an incredible man. I, I met Don Graves about four years ago. He, he and I were on the same honor flight to take Washington uh, Veterans World War II vets to Washington. And we just kind of clicked. You know, some people you meet, you just click with them. And he and I did that. He had some same visions about our country, about our God. And I said, why don't we go and let you talk to some people. He said, well, I hadn't done that. I said, let's try to see what happens. Well, we, long story short, we went to uh, Whitesboro, Texas. Most of you don't know where that is. They don't even have a red light there. Okay? But they had four members. Don and I started there. And it, it just grew and grew and grew and grew. In fact, I will tell you that he, he's about to wear me out. He's 94, I'm 78. But last year, we ended up going to 97 different speaking engagements, which is an incredible number, if y'all can imagine that. But correct what Mark said, uh, he, God calls me his gopher and his chauffeur and his booking agent. And that pretty well covers it all. But we have a good time doing this, and I wanted to, uh, to let y'all know that he had, until about nine years ago, he had never said a word about his experience on Iwo Jima. He ended up, and he was in Dallas at the Anatole, sitting in the lobby waiting to go on. He, he has an incredible voice, and he was singing for a group at the Anatole. Uh, he called a small group, only 800 people. And he uh, he was waiting there, and there was a gentleman who walked in the door, about as far as the period of your back wall, and he had he saw Don's cap. He has a Iwo Jima cap he always wears. And this gentleman walked across the uh, Lobby just as fast as he could because he's about the same age. And uh, he got to Don and he he's standing there and he does this he, with his index finger. He pokes Don in the chest like this hard. He said, you saved my life. And what kind of opening for a conversation was that? And he said, he says to the fellow, he said, well, how could I have saved your life? I don't even know you. And he said, I was flying a B-51 Mustang over Iwo Jima while y'all were still fighting to secure it. He said, I had to, to put my plane down. And I called ahead, your, your uh, command center said, do not, do not come in. It's too fierce fighting. He said, I told him, I said, I'm coming in, I've got to set it down. He said, you might as well clear the deck because I'm coming. He got down there and ended up with, uh, he said his plane was shot all two pieces. He had less than six gallons of fuel left. He was 600 miles from base. He said, you kept me from going into the ocean, having to ditch it, and I would have been a shark bait. So that's why I said, you saved my life. And that's what turned him on. And there's not a switch that I know of that will turn him off from speaking. He loves doing this. 
He's, he's really good at it, and I'm really proud to be his partner. And uh, uh, we've got a couple of uh, things that we'd like to show a, bit, a short video. It's about a four-minute video. It's Doug Dunbar did an interview with Don about four years ago. Channel, he's Channel 11 News. And if they, they put that thing up for consideration on the national media level, they want an image with this video. And we're proud to show it. It's about a four and a half minute limit. It's not a, not a big deal, but it's a great way to introduce it. This image, seen by so many around the world, marks a monumental moment in a battle that took thousands of American lives, the raising of that American flag on Iwo Jima, Japan. Five Marines are in the iconic photo, but many more stood just outside the focus of the lens that day. And that includes a North Texas man who returned to that exact spot recently, and that was the first time back there since that epic, bloody battle back in 1945. My name is Don Graves. I arrived on Green Beach 1, third wave, on February 19th, 1945, at 8 o'clock in the morning. With flamethrower in hand, this photo of Don Graves was taken in the first minutes of his arrival in the black sands of Iwo Jima with a 70-pound fuel tank on his back. Two Marines grabbed me up on my feet. We headed for the beach, which was about 25 feet away, and we hit the sand, tried to bury in, and then all of a sudden the motor started coming. The Japanese unleashed a ferocious attack. The Marines moved forward inch by bloody inch. Flamethrower Graves helped lead the charge to route the Japanese from 11 miles of secret and strategic tunnels. I'd go up there, two men, one on my left and right, and I'd pour fire into the hole. It took three days to go just 600 feet, three deadly days for the Marines to take the high ground of Mount Suribachi. And in that iconic moment, when those Marines raised the flag, Graves was literally just to one side of the camera lens. I could have helped raise that flag. But he says that now infamous celebration was short-lived. Minutes after they planted Old Glory. You almost thought hell opened up its doors because they were infuriated. We put our flag on Japanese soil. Don Graves watched good friends die. Many of their bodies never recovered, which is why when the daughters of World War II offered him the rare chance to return to Iwo Jima, he didn't hesitate. March 10th, Graves left DFW. Three days later, he was back on Iwo Jima, opened just one day a year with a short invitation list by the Japanese government. The battlefield, once barren and dry, now lush and green. And Don Graves stood in that very same spot where his fellow Marines had raised that flag. But it was the beach that called, that sinking black sand, where the majority of the nearly 7,000 Marine lives were lost. An image Don Graves can't get out of his head 68 years later. I could see where I, uh, in combat, the beach was loaded with machinery of ours and tracks, half tracks and tanks turned upside down, stuck out of the water. It was a disaster all the way to Suribachi. And I could hear everything. I just stood there and I looked. I could even hear the voices. It all came back. Now there's something different about this sand. It isn't just volcanic ash. You have to realize how many marine boots stomped on this sand and were buried under it. And that's something to think about. Don Graves is living history, a first-person voice in a battle that changed our world. The return to Iwo Jima gave him closure. The war he fought makes him forever proud to be a United States Marine. We fought a tough battle, one of the worst. And we beat them. And the kind of kids we were is an example for the kids today to learn. So many guys were just outside the lens that day, and Don Graves was one of them. Uh, wanted to share this with you. Don brought this back, and he was so kind to let me borrow it to share with you guys. This is sand 
from Iwo Jima, the very same beach that he came up on in 1945, and he grabbed a vial of this on his way out. He brought it home with him, saying that he's going to bring this home, and he's going to treasure it forever because of the, the boots and the memories of the men sure. who were with him, who served, who died on that beach that day and in the ensuing days of the battle. And how vivid are his memories yeah, to this a, day? A great storyteller, and, that, and that's a first-person account again. These, these guys are dying at a rapid mm -hmm. rate. They're not going to be with us long, and pretty soon it's only going to be in the history books. So it's a treasure to be able to have a guy like Don Graves sit down yeah and share that story and with us. And how special that he got to return to Japan. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Beautiful story. We're y'all definitely welcome. Don Graves. It's a joy to be here and a privilege to be with a bunch of pilgrims. <laughs> <laughs> Where to start? There's so many things to talk about. Number one, I love my country. Amen. Amen. It's got the greatest flag in the world. It's got the greatest history. When you stop to think of where we were, where we've come from, but I'll tell you about the greatest generation. Do we have any greatest generation here? Right there. You'll know what I'm talking about. As you go through the Great Depression, I was born in 1925. I remember the Depression very well. Born and raised in Detroit, one of the poorest cities during the Depression. And I can remember my mother. She had bought a beautiful white set of uh, if you remember the wicker furniture, it was, it was reasonably priced. A lot of people had it. And she was proud of it in our apartment. My dad was working at Henry Ford's, just down the road, Woodward Avenue. Then all of a sudden, he's fixing his lunch. He takes off for work on the second shift. One hour later, he came back, threw his lunch on the table, and he said 3,500 of us were sent home and not to expect a return. The depression was on. Everything shut down. Nobody got any money unless you worked for the city, the county, the state, and the government. The only ones that had money. I can remember about two days after this happened, my father took off. Someone knocked at the door, and she went to the door, and there was a deputy sheriff standing there. And he had two furniture movers with him. And they let, she let them in, and they went and took all of her furniture out, loaded it up in a van, and took off back to the store. They knew she couldn't pay for it. That happened all over. People lost a lot of stuff. You know, folks, what you don't have, you don't miss. So the greatest generation kids didn't whine and cry because we didn't have a lot of stuff. We never had it in the first place. I can remember my brother and I, my two sisters, we gathered around for just after supper, and my dad was sitting there, my mother, she was sort of a spokesperson. She said, we're going to have to board you kids out. We can't afford to keep you. That happened a lot. County paid for it, the kids being in. And usually it was a widow or it was a woman who was never married. And we all had fun doing that. We really did. But we were with our parents for about a year, and then all of a sudden, they came and got us. But I can remember that we never were church. We didn't go to church. Depression kids in the big cities. We didn't spend time at church because we were ashamed to be there. We were ashamed of what we had on. Our mothers would take our clothes and spit polish them and clean them and do everything they could with the old hot plate iron. Never really looked good. We didn't go to church. I never really prayed in my life. Well, let's hurry along. Now I'm 16 years old. There are three of, my, three of us buddies. Three of us went off. I went in the Marines. Johnny Loftus went in the Navy. 
And Stanley went off with the RCEF because we really didn't have a lot of Air Force at the time, or Air Corps. We're sitting in an old car in front of my house in Detroit. It is December 8th, the day after Pearl Harbor. And we're sitting there listening to the big bands. Got a blanket around us, it's cold. We have our hats on, you know, jackets. Then all of a sudden the program stopped. And the announcer got on and he said, ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this broadcast. The President of the United States is going to speak to the nation. And I heard this speech. I've gone through a lot of presidents. I've never heard this speech so great. Never before or after. I'll never forget it. And he well remembers it. And some of you have probably heard it. This is what he said. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a day that will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked upon by the naval and armed forces of the Empire of Japan. I interpret the will of Congress and of the people, no matter how long it may take. We shall gain triumph and victory, so help us God. Greatest speech I ever heard. I said to my two buddies, I'm skipping school tomorrow and I'm going down to the Marine Corps office and I'm going to join the Marine Corps. My father was in the First World War in the Marines. He told me all about it. They said, you can't, you're only 16, you got to be 17. I said, I'll go down there, get the papers, bring it back to my mother and dad, they'll sign it. They said, your mom won't sign it. We know, she won't sign that paper. Next morning, I got up and I told my siblings, I said, no two kids tell mom anything about this, and I took off downtown Detroit. And wound, wound up in the federal village, walked up on the third or fourth floor, and there was a gunny sergeant in the doorway, and he met me. He said, young man, what can I do for you? And I said, I want to join up. He said, how old are you? I said, 16. He says, I can't take you. You've got to be 17 years old. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a piece of paper. You take this to your mother and father. And when you're 17, you bring that. Well, as soon as they sign that paper, you get 17. You come down here and you see me. We can do business. Are you willing to do that? I said, yes, sir. I took the paper, went home, and you know, folks, I was so excited, I ran all the way home, I forgot I skipped school. <laughs> Walked in, gave my mother the paper. She says, what are you doing home? Well, I give her some excuses, you know, and she bawled me out, you know. She says, well, you're wasting your time because I'm not going to sign those papers. I went through one already, and I'm not going through another one. I'm not going to do this. You're going to stay in school. Now, she got to sign those papers. She said, throw them away. I went in the dining room, tucked them under some papers in the buffet drawer. Six months later, I was 17. We just had a small little party. And I went and got that paper out, and I took it in. My father was there. And I said, Mom and Dad, you got to sign this paper. I'm going to go off in the morning club. My mother said, where'd you get this paper? And I gave her some excuses. Well, she says, again, you're wasting your time because I'm not going to go through this. Forget it. My dad said, Vera, listen to me. The boy quit school. He's doing odd jobs. He could turn out to be a bum. And I did this to my mother. <laughs> Just give me the paper. <laughs> she gave me the, I gave her the paper. She signed it. He signed it. I took off downtown. Sergeant met me again. There were other kids sitting out there. And I walked in with the papers. He says, beautiful. He said, now I'm going to tell you something. Before you go home, see that door over there? I said, yes, sir. He said, you're going to go in that door, and you're going to need a Navy doctor. And he's going to check you over inside and out from the top of your head to the tip of your toe, and you ain't never going to 
forget it. And folks, I still remember it, and so does he. Still remember it. Well, I passed. I came out. He said, go home. Tell your mother and father that I will give them a call in two weeks. They'll take you down to the train station. We'll have a ceremony. We'll go off to San Diego, Marine Corps Base, boot camp. I said, yes, sir, and I took off. Got their call. They took me down to the train station. There were about 12 or 13 of us teenagers. We were all standing in a row. Folks were all in the back. He said, before we do anything here, I want you to do one final thing for me. I want you to go back to your parents and your siblings, and I want you to say goodbye, and I want you back here in three and a half minutes. Zoom, we went back there, hoo hoo, cried, everything. Came back, stood in line. We stood at attention. We pledged the allegiance. We swore an oath. And all of us in the room saying, God bless America. And then we loaded up and took off. I'm going to hurry through this. Eight weeks of boot camp. I'll never forget those eight weeks. Made a young man out of me. Took the cockiness out of me. Now there's a difference between young men that go in the Marine Corps or Navy or Army, whichever, but especially in the Marine Corps, they have a tendency today to whine and cry. Now we have a third discharge paper in the Marine Corps. It's called undesirable. Didn't happen during the Second World War, folks. When you had tears in your eyes, the old guy walk up and stick his nose in your face. Oh. Do I see a tear in your eye there? <laughs> Suck it up! Swing it up! Be a man! My gosh, we had to do it. Yeah. Now that's the kind of kids we were. And that's what we were taught. And the reason we went off in the Marine I, I say the Marine Corps, and there was no draft on just yet. Every one of us kids that stood in line with me. We went in there because we loved our family, we loved our pride, we loved everything about America. We believed that we were taught at school that we had the most beautiful country in the world. And nobody was going to come and take it away from us. <laughs> and some of these so-called politicians ought to pack up and go to Russia and see how they like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's hurry along. Knuckle politics. <laughs> Can't help it though. I'm ticked off. Are you? Yes. Yes. Right. You better with those uniforms on. <laughs> All right. I would join the second anti tank battalion. I drove a Dodge pickup truck with three men in the back. I sat. I was the driver. Right next to my head was the 37 millimeter anti tank gun. And we were taught how to knock out tanks. Well, we were all set to go and get on one of the islands. Then we got the word that it won't work. We're going to break this up. The previous tanks we had bogged down. Couldn't use them. The Japanese took their old tanks and they barreled them, burled them down and used them for, ant for artillery. So they broke us up. They broke the Marine Raiders up. They broke the uh, paratroopers up. And we all went back to the States after and helped form the 5th Marine Division at Camp Pendleton. This division was designed by President Roosevelt and my boss, Admiral Nimitz. They had a meeting. MacArthur was there. I can't tell you who else. An Admiral told us this. I spoke, I asked for questions, and the Admiral stood up and he said, fellas, he said, I spent the entire war at the Pentagon. I never boarded ship. He said, President wanted to know what the mortality rate would be to take and secure Iwo Jima. And that was Harry Truman. And they sent word back seven million casualties completely, enemy and us, whatever happened. 
And he said, no. Harry Truman said, we're going to drop the bomb. It's not going to happen. Now, Roosevelt and Nimitz both agreed together. MacArthur said, bypass Iwo Jima. He, he wheeled up to the screen, and he took his stick. And we knew what he was doing. He was near the uh, Secretary of the Navy. And he pointed to a spot near Tokyo. He said, gentlemen, do you know where I'm pointing? Who did it, Bill? Nimitz stood up. He said, sir, I believe you might be right around Iwo Jima. He said, exactly. I want that island. And Nimitz says, sir, I want that island too. MacArthur said, bypass. Too costly. Well, it was designed, and here they were forming it. My first regimental commander was Jimmy Roosevelt, who was also commander of the 3rd Marine uh, Raider Battalion. It all broke up, so he came into the 5th. He had us, he helped organize us, then all of a sudden the old man called him to Washington. We never saw him again. Don't know what happened to him. But Harry the Horse Liver said, Bella Wood, First World War decorated, became my regimental commander. And he meant business. The 5th Division was designed to spearhead Iwo Jima next to Suribachi, Green Beach 1, and secure Mount Suribachi. They knew that that was the focal point of all the firepower on every troop that ever hit the island. That's what we were designed to do. We never heard the word Iwo Jima. It was never, ever mentioned. We did not know where we were going until one day off the island. They brought models, clay models of the island. They told us everything, where we were going to go, what we were supposed to do. We went through the whole thing. And I said, Lieutenant, how long do you think we'll be on that island? He said, well, with God's speed and a little luck, you ought to be off in about a week. He said, there's eight square miles there. But we don't know much of anything else. Well, the next morning we got up for chow early, five o'clock in the morning. We slept topside on an LST. Six previous tractors down below and a company of Marines topside. Everyone had that. And there were a lot of them. Three divisions. Well, there it is out there. We have chow. And guess what they fed us? Steak and eggs. Now, I had eggs through the Marine Corps. Cold story. Some of them were eight, nine months old. But steak, the Marine Corps never bought me a steak. You had to go on liberty to get a steak. So I said to a kid next to me, I said, hey, what's with the steak and eggs? He said, Graves, use your head. What did they do with convicts before they executed them? <laughs> <laughs> all hands down below load to amphibious landing craft. We all went down. I had a man on my left, a man on my right. I had a 72-pound flamethrower on my back. I was an inch shorter then than I am now. And I was also a few pounds lighter. But it was on my back. And we waddled down the gangway, and there we are on the side of this amphibious tractor. No front entrance to go in. You went over the side, you came out over the side. And these two guys picked me up, and they got me up on the edge and shoved me right over in, and I went over in. I got myself squared where everybody loaded up. Out the gateway went, the mouth we went, and we rallied around the 28th Regiment. We were supposed to go in third way at Green Beach 1 next to Surabachi and secure Surabachi, join the rest of our division on the other side and go towards the north. The fourth went in on the right by the airstrips to get that secure. The third remained in reserve for about a week. Couldn't get them all on. So we're in the amphibious tractor, he takes off, Every now and then I'd hear an explosion and they would hit one of our craft and take the entire load out. Fortunately, by the grace of God, I don't understand it all, but we were spared. We hit the beach. All hands overboard. 
And I said, all hands overboard. I'm going to get over this thing. So they picked me up again, shoved me over in the water. You never hit, you never hit the beach. You always hit the water. And I got myself up. They grabbed me. We hit the first sandbar. There's three ridges to go over to get to the top. We soon learned that if you started running to the top and you tried to go over, you didn't go over. They stopped you. And we were pinned down on that beach. No place to go. But we knew this. If you want to get off the island, you've got to get off the beach and take the island. Little by little, we moved up. I lay on that first sandbar. Remember I told you I never went to church much? I lay there with a face in the sand, and for the first time, I prayed. I really prayed to God Almighty. And I said, God, I said, I don't know much about you, but if you can do for me what you've done for other people, and you get me off this island, I will serve you, <coughs> serve you the rest of my life. He got me off, folks, eight weeks later. But he didn't get me until nine years after that. I'll close with that very shortly. I got up on my knees. They helped me up on my feet. We made it to the third top without getting hit, except my two buddies. They were gone. I didn't have anybody. It was a mess. We had two regiments in tangles. So you had to ask a buddy, what, what up did she in? What are you in, you know? So I got up on top and I turned left and I went in the first shell hole. Navy made the best foxholes that we never crawled into. Custom made, all ready for you. Three men. You couldn't dig a hole there. It came right in on you. Well, I crawled in that hole and there's another Marine there facing Surabacha with his M1 pointed towards it. It's beginning to get sundown. That's how long it took. Do you know that uh, Surabachi was 545 feet from the beach? We got there the third day. Third day. Well, I said, hey, Mac, what I'll pitch you in. Never answered me. I reached over to grab him, move him, and I noticed then that his bottom half of his body was across the other side of the hole. I got out of that hole, went to the next one. I stayed the night there. When I got to the base, some kid yelled out, Graves, hold up. It was a buddy of mine. He got entangled from one regiment to another. He said, I'll be with you. I'll help you. I said, okay, good. So we fought together. We got to the base. It took us a whole day of the third day to get up towards three quarters, towards the ridge. Now, our battalion commander told Lieutenant Cheryl Schreier to get some boys when he got up there and put this flag up. He took it off a ship that it was on. He wanted that flag up there. Well, when we heard what happened, I said, they'll never get it up. They don't have a mast. They didn't even have it. Where did he get the flag? We don't know anything about a flag. Well, they got it up. They found drain pipe up there that the Japanese used to catch all the water that when it came and got it down into to, um, Surabachi in the caves. Well, let's not spend any time on the flag. It went up, it was glorious, it was a sight to behold, but all it did was infuriated the Japanese all the more and they fought crazy. We took a day and spent up there, secured it. Then we came down the next morning. We went to Hill 362A. Ask any Marine if he knows where Hill 362A is on Iwo Jima. And if he knows, he'll say, I sure do. I lost my battalion there. We lost our officers there. It was slaughter. We finally secured it the next day, moved to the north. I'm going to tell you just two or three things before we close. The first episode I had, I was sitting in a hole with two machine gun squad leaders. We each had a squad, lost it. No men. We were down pretty nil. Gunny sergeants, buck sergeants were one of the companies, the platoons, even corporals. And 
the phone, my phone rings. And it said, Graves. I said, yo. He said, come for a CP. I'm going to pass this word down along the line. He had to look out for snipers. I said, we don't have any sniper problem right now. He said, well, we do. First sergeant caught one around in his leg. They know where we're at. Be on the lookout, report to us. I said, 10 4. I took my glasses, took my plane sore off, crawled up on my knees, and I got my elbows on the ground looking around, just looking around. I would say for about 15 minutes, I saw nothing. And I dropped back down, slid back down, and I reported that I saw nothing, negative. They said, keep looking. By the way, you got a kid coming there for your replacement. He'll be there in 10 minutes. I said, 10 four, we can use it. 10 minutes later, he crawled in a hole and said, who's Graves? I am, what do you want me to do it? Sit down over there, be a lot to do when the evening comes. Well, they got on the horn, the kid heard that message again. He said, Graves, let me take a look. And I said, no, I get yourself shot. My, one of my buddies says, give him the glasses, he's here to fight, use him. So I gave him the glasses, he got right up where I had been, right next to me. And he's looking. And we're just talking Marine talk. Then all of a sudden, <coughs> he fell back. His helmet spun off his head. Went around a circle between my feet. It stopped. I looked down on that helmet. I saw a beautiful girl sitting in a chair. And on her lap, was a beautiful little baby. I lost it. I got up, I shook my fist in the sky, and I said, curse you, and Jima, curse the Marine Corps. Listen, folks, and curse God for letting that kid take my place. We didn't understand. And we really didn't care about anything anymore. Well, my buddy got up, slapped me in the face, threw me on the ground, I lay there, and it was crazy. I laughed. I just laughed until I stopped, nobody said a word. We got up, I put my stuff back on, we moved to another hole. Now in that hole, that we spent a whole day there before we had to move. I said to my two buddies, you know, we were just kids, I, I'm gonna make some hot chocolate. Well, they said, make it up for the three of us. I said, okay. We all had ration bar, chocolate D-bar, remember them? D-bars. We diced them babies up. Um, I, I just made a nice little helmet liner of hot chocolate. I made a little firework demolition. It was good. We sat there watching and waiting. And you could smell that hot chocolate. All of a sudden, uh, I want to say about from here, out in the middle of that park right there. Hey, my room! Very good hot chocolate. You bring hot chocolate here. I said, if you want hot chocolate, you come here and get it. He said, oh, no, you bring here. <laughs> Next one. We got word we're going to be released. One by one, we were released to go down to the beach, our cemetery. It's down by the beach at the foot of Surabachi. It was. They asked if we moved them. All three were moved. All the bodies were exhumed, so they say. Well, one by one, we were released by the 3rd Division. Folks, I hit that beach with 335 of my buddies in my company. Six weeks later, on the 31st of March, we walked down to the beach, 18 of us. No officers, very few sergeants. Just a bunch of kids. Walked down to the beach by our cemetery. The old man was there, Lewis Edge. He said, men, I want you to line up and file and go through our cemetery before we board the Haggis and go on our transport, go back to Hilo, Hawaii, and get ready for Japan. He said, I want you to go in and say goodbye to your officers and your buddies. One by one, we marched through that, that arch. And on the left side of the arch, and I will never forget this, on the left side of the arch, there was a sign hung there, attacked. And somebody wrote it, and I've got a hunch, we don't know, but I think we, I, we actually believe that it was a CB. 
It said this. Every Marine looked at it and walked in. Fellas, when you go home, tell the folks we did our best that they may have many more tomorrows. Fellas, ladies, all of you here, all of you, I tell this to high schools, the junior high school, all of you, you've been enjoying those many more tomorrow, and you're not even aware of it. I wish these radicals in Washington, wherever they are, would hear something like this and realize what happened and what people, young Marines did for them. Kids, teenagers, young men, they love their country and love that fight that they hate. And we respected the Civil War. We respected the Northern part because the two together made the greatest generation in the world. And it still is if we only own up to it and do something about it. That's the way we were. We got aboard the Higgins, went back to heal a Hawaiian train for Japan. Japan surrendered. I went there in occupation for three and a half months. Came back to Penelope. They sent me to Great Lakes, Illinois, because I'm from Detroit, to be discharged. I went home. Six months later, I got married to a little four, ten and a half gal. I was 21, she was 18. Six months we were married. We're laying in bed one night in bed. It was hot in Detroit. That humidity was terrible. Month of August. I said, honey, I said, would you like to make the Marine Corps a career? I wanted to go back in. She says, I wouldn't mind. I said, good. Got up the next morning, sold everything we had. And you, you can imagine what we had because all I got was $200 for everything. We took a Cadillac out to a dealership. And we got out there. The first morning we were there, we jumped the streetcar, went to L.A., Marine office upstairs. I walked in the doorway, the sergeant met me. He said, what can you do for you, Mac? And I said, I want to join Re-Up. He's got your papers, and here they are. He said, good, wait till you leave. I said, tomorrow morning. Good, hey, wait a minute, you're not married, are you? And I said, I got married six months ago. He said, I can't take you. We're not taking women in right now because they stopped the allotment checks. You'd make $72 to start that. You, I don't know if you're going to make it. I don't think I'd do that. I said, thank you. Wait a minute, he said. Do you think she would like a, would she mind having a brief uh, divorce? I said, I'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Went out in the outer office. The sergeant was behind me looking out the door. She said, what did he say? I said, he wants to know if you go for a brief divorce. She said, let's go. <laughs> Out the door, and when I turned around, here's the sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of my Marine Corps, right there. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I was invited to go to a Billy Graham Youth for Christ rally in Oshkosh up along Lake Winnebago. But I wasn't in shape to go to any Christian meeting, I can tell you that. I'd been fishing for all day, and the fish just didn't bite, but the battle bass did. And I had a lot of battle bass, and I was in bad shape. Phone rang, my wife, we were ready for breakup and divorce, we weren't making it at all. It was mostly my fault. Phone rang. I heard her, I watched her talk, she hung it up, came over, she said, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, we'd like to know if you'd take them over to Oshkosh to a Billy Graham rally. And I said, well, I don't have any use for Billy, I don't know anything about Billy, I don't want that, and I laid back down. So she walked away. Ten minutes later, the phone rang again, I'm going to close with this. The phone rang again. I got up, grabbed the phone, I said, hello. He said, Donald. This is Peter Beale. I said, yes, sir. I respected both of you and his wife. They were in their 80s, godly people. They helped us a lot. And I said, yes, sir. He said, don't say one word. I have something to tell you. I said, yes, sir. 
You are a mess. You're losing your wife. You're losing your best friends. And you're going to lose more. And you're going to lose yourself because you can't help yourself. You need help. You need to take us to this meeting tonight. Will you do it? I said, yes, sir. I'll change clothes and I'll be right over. God was beginning to remind me of something. Went over and picked him up, went to the high school, 2,700 people. They put me in the front row, right by the stage. All of a sudden, the screen started, and the crusade started, and the one thing I remember, Billy came out, started, and he pointed his finger. And he looked like he was talking to me. He looked like his finger was right at me. He said, you are not your own. You're going to the place. And that place was Jesus Christ on Calvary. Glory to the Christ. Glory to the Christ, Father. He paid for the sins of the whole world. Your life is a mess. You can't help yourself. You can't do anything for yourself. You need to come tonight. You come tonight. You come. Later on, the, thing, the film stopped. Old preacher got up on the stage and he said, we're going to have a song of invitation. And he said, while we're singing, you feel the need for Christ. Walk up to the front, we'll pray for you, give you a Bible, some scripture, and send you home. I paid no attention to it. They started singing. And it was beautiful. And then I just fell out of my seat and on the floor and I cried. And I confessed everything I had done. I said, God, I used you as a rabbit's foot. I used you as a scapegoat. I'm sorry. I'm a hypocrite. A liar. I'm no good. And I began to pour everything out. Then all of a sudden, the preacher, the preacher said, normally when we get through doing this, we would send you home. But I know that you're there. And you need Christ in your life. And we're going to do it the last time. And when we're through, we're going home. You come up here. We want to talk to you. I said, if they sing it again, I'll go up. They started singing. I got up on my feet. And a voice said to me, this is no pipe dream. Sit down, you fool. What about your wife? And I said, this isn't going to work. It's just not going to work. I turned around and looked at my wife. She's sitting there watching me. She got up, walked over to me, took my hand, and she said, let's both walk up. We walked up to the front. They prayed for us, gave us scripture. I paid not much attention at all. I was talking of God. I was pouring my heart out. He got a hold of me. He beat me up like a father that loved his son. That's what God did to me. He put me in the ministry for 32 years, serving five churches and evangelism and prison work and homeless work. I had a full-time ministry. I left my last church at 82 years old because my wife got very ill with dementia and cardiovascular. Get this, the second best thing that ever happened to me. My daughter called. They lived in Keller here. We were in Tucson, Arizona. She said, Dad, we can't keep crying every time Ma has a fall or, or something happens to her. You've got to bring her here. We have a lot of facility here. I said, move to Texas? She said, yes, you've got to come here. Resign. You're not going to move any mountains anymore. I said, OK, I'll do it. I resigned from the church. We moved to Keller, Texas. I met Laura Leopard, Tom Leopard, the mayor of Dallas. Laura and I became friends. She became, I, I came to one of her meetings and they sang the national anthem. She said, Don, would you like to go out speaking? And I said, yes. We teamed up for a while, but her work, daughters of World War II, became so critical that she gave up on it. Then I met Paul, and that's how we teamed up. The greatest thing that happened to me was encounter of faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The second was to move to Texas. 
<laughs> and if you would text and give yourself an applause. Yeah. And God bless America. Can you hear me out there? Yes. All right. Stand up and sing with me, will you? Let's sing Kate Smith's song. God bless America. Let's sing it. And it's 
it's our pleasure to be able to do this. And it's, you know, as he said, we're dedicated. And uh, I wanted to, I was given the authority to pass the basket around if any of you would feel led to, to be of help to us because it takes money to do this. It takes us $3,500 every month to do this. But we appreciate anything you can do for us. And uh, they're on the, on, I've got a picture of back there. I thought I'd bring it up here. It'd be too clumsy to do. But there's a picture of 66 World War II veterans in that picture. And we're proud of what we do because these vets deserve our help to feed them once a month for what they've done for our country. Yes, sir. What's the location? It's at Fort Worth, Texas. It's at uh, Birchman Baptist Church. I've got some cards back there. In fact, I've got one loop to here. I'll just kind of give you an eye heads up. On the top of the card, it says rollcall.org. If you want to donate with uh, PayPal, you can do that. My contact information is here on the lower left. We've got videos on the uh, lower right-hand side. But if y'all, any of you guys, we can't keep doing what we're doing without help. And any of you guys that have contact with organizations, groups, it, it don't matter. We, we like to, we go out, we spoke to five high schools last year, and we had let the least number of students we had was 600 in front of us. We had 1,200, 1,500, 2, students. And that's what we love to do. These kids don't have a clue what you guys stand for and what we stand for and for our best. Yes, sir. What I wanted to say was that the primary purpose is to get these guys away from their apartment, get them out of their, part of their rooms, because a lot of them are, are alone. They're all alone, you know. And uh, you should hear them in their camaraderie. They can't stop talking. Yeah. They love it. So thank you very much, and I'll go ahead and start this around if we could. And we'd appreciate anything that y'all can do for us. Appreciate it. Pleasure to be with you. And Paul, we, we do appreciate you being here today and for what you've had to say and tell us about Roll Call and also your role in, in bringing down with us today. We would like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. <laughs> as well as a give it up. As, as well as a the, mic. the famous mug. The mic. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, if Mike was on the back table, uh, they did bring some pictures and some, some literature and stuff. So if you're leaving today, make sure you stop back. Please do. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you, Paul. You. Thank you, Don. Good to see you again, my friend. Interesting to know when I first met these two gentlemen back in February, Paul and I had a brief conversation. He was involved with Honor Flight. And I think a lot of people in the audience will remember where a friend of mine came and talked to us last year about Honor Flight, Terry Kaysen. So, hi to you from Terry. All right, because of the size of this meeting and because of some things that we're going to be doing here very shortly, I'm going to dispense with most of the uh, committee reports and officers reports. I will say this, you've got a copy of the local of the most recent treasurer's report, and everybody trusts Nick. And we've gotten the um, secretary's uh, uh, minutes have been posted. And corrected. And corrected. Yes, I saw that. Well done. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything to report right now. Robert Kittrell from the Color Guard. Um, anything to report at all? If not, I'm going to dispense. Uh, oh, no, I want to I wanna recognize John Morton on the veterans. Since we have a number of veterans here, is there anything to report for you and the veterans? No, we just like to have everybody bring uh, personal items. Uh, uh, once a month, uh, we go down and, uh, and give to the veterans. So uh, coffee, personal items, they love it. Thank you very much. Mike. Yeah, just a general reminder of the first at the Dallas VA, the amputee clinic beside the main hospital, first Wednesday of every month, uh, Six o'clock until eight o'clock. We have a bingo and ice cream social. We've been doing that for 15 years. It's uh, used to be part of the Park City's Rotary. Now it's just a bunch of vets because the Park City's Rotary doesn't fund it anymore. So uh, please join us again first Wednesday of every month around six at night. Thank you, Mike. John Greer, I believe you have a few words. 
How many of you serve in the service from May 1st, I'm sorry, May 15th, 1955 to, I'm sorry, November 1st, 1955 to May 15th, 1975, that have not received the Vietnam pin? Okay. Did y'all come forward? The Department, the Department of Defense in 19, in 2012 started a new program honoring Vietnam veterans. And President Obama signed the proclamation. Last year, President Trump signed the proclamation that March the 29th until 2025 will be known as Vietnam Recommendation Day. Now, the reason that, that between 75 and 25, that's the 50th year. So that's how the 50th year commemoration came about. So what we, the Sons of the American Revolution is a commemorative partner with the Department of Air Defense. And uh, I am, uh, my chapter, which is Edmund Terrell up in Denison, is a commemorative partner. The only place that you can get one of these pins is from a commemorative partner. You cannot find it on the internet. It is not available. But what we like to do is I like to thank you for your service and a grateful nation thanks you for your service. And on the back of the pin, when you, put, when you take it out, there is a little engraving that says a grateful nation thanks you for, for your service. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Uh, were any of you Vietnam vets? Vietnam vets? Yeah, 63, 69. Okay. Um, I'm not Vietnam vet. Still 63. You mean Vietnam? Yeah. Well, I didn't go to Vietnam, but I was there during the Vietnam. Okay, well, that, that, that's, that was a, I served in the program. Now, the other thing that we have, which is which is really nice, is if, if, if you you pass away, hopefully it's not pretty time soon, uh, they have gotten a pen for the widows of people that served in that. Thing. And I'll go ahead and show you what the pen is. It's a really nice pen that, that they do. It's got a blue star. <laughs> in the center of it. So these we these we've been given out. Uh, I got Gary Lovell in the back who is a uh, uh, commander of the fire department. He was a captain fire department, Dallas Fire Department. Yeah, and he's on the honor guard. So Gary gives these Gary I got some more of these I'll give you. And what he does is when he goes to a, a funeral of a veteran that has died and the widow's there. Uh, she has never been given anything, so mm -hmm. this is a new pen that they've got. Um, I contacted the Department of Defense and uh, asked them if they had a budget, a travel budget, and they said that they do have a travel budget. And so we're talking about getting them to come down to the State Fair of Texas, and I've been talking to the DAR that we're going to be able to set up a table in the DAR house, try to get on the news, uh, in the newspapers, try to get on television so that all the Vietnam veterans that come through the DAL house here in the fair will be able to receive one of these pins. Thank, yeah, you, no, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, John. Appreciate it. With that said, we'd now like to celebrate. I'm going to have uh, our secretary, who's good at wielding a knife, proceed to our table. We have plates, we have forks, we're going to have a photo op. What I'd like to do is, in that, on that wall below that picture of the flower, we have a banner. And I'd like everybody to get up from their chair and do a semicircle around our center table here, because we're going to hold a banner, we're going to get a picture, we're going to cut a cake, and we're going to celebrate. So if I can get some help with that banner. And Paul, Dan Frank, can you come forward? 
chapter, 90th anniversary, dear President Van Fossen. And my recent visit to Texas, and he was here in Texas visiting, actually, I learned that the Dallas chapter is celebrating their 90th anniversary, July 4th, 2019. In fact, your chapter presented me with a coffee cup celebrating that event, which we did. He has one of our anniversary cups. Uh, this is a special, uh, significant event, and I uh, compliment you on this milestone. Very few chapters in our organization can claim such longevity and success. I have been a dual member of the Texas SAR for a number of years and have always recognized the contribution and activities of your members and chapter. Unfortunately, I will still be in California for the National Congress and be unable to personally attend your 90th anniversary celebration. However, I didn't want to pass up the opportunity to congratulate you and I hope to still be active and be able to join you in 10 years when I am quite certain, certain you'll be celebrating your centennial anniversary. Put that on your calendar, guys. Congratulations and keep up the outstanding work. We need more chapters like you in Texas and across the country. I look forward to seeing the photos of your celebration on your website and your Facebook. Sincerely, Warren M. Alter, President General. There you go, guys. Everybody get some cake? Well, a little more help would help. Okay, let's get some help. <laughs> I didn't think you'd ever ask. Who's going to show you It's all right. It's all right. I'm coming here. Huh? Yeah, it is Yeah, no, baby, baby. <laughs> 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 
because of our time this morning to help us clean up and move tables and put chairs backs and take the flags down. I'd appreciate any help we can get. We will have the drawing next month for the raffle because we've got a bunch of stuff that we've got to do next month and we're running out of time. Keep your tickets exactly right. To, to get this to the proper, to the proper place, could I have our Could I have our Frank Pounders? Could you give us the benediction? Okay, but not first. Join me as we go along our way. Dear God, keep your hand upon us. Keep our eyes upon you so that all that we do will reflect the glory that you are and this nation continues to be. Keep it that way. Keep it free for all. In the name of the Christ. Amen. 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 And please join me in our closing. Until we meet again, let us remember our obligations to our forefathers who gave us our Constitution the Bill of Rights, an independent Supreme Court, and a nation of free men. We are adjourned.